so the last thing we did was we talked about moving from an average rate of change to an instantaneous rate of change, which we called a derivative. So all the derivative is doing now is looking at an, an exact point on this curve and finding the slope. So the slope is the derivative. And how we did that is watch this t-axis here gets smaller and smaller. So that's that gap, that's that H. So as we zoom in and that gap gets smaller and smaller and smaller, then what happens is this becomes linear and that's the whole piece of letting your H go to zero. So this is what we defined, okay, as the slope of the curve, the derivative um, at a particular point, X sub zero could have been where we were doing the toaster flying at exactly one second. So the interpretations of this now, that we have this limit piece in here, this is our calculus now, is the slope of the graph. Okay, so we have some graph. Once again, it could be the last example we did with the toaster. The slope of the tangent at a particular point. The rate of change, instantaneous rate of change at a particular point. This is what we're going to start to use a lot more, the derivative. We're going to ask you to find the derivative, find the derivative, find the derivative. All right? So it says previously we found the derivative at a particular point. Again, maybe looking at time equals 1 of the flying toaster, time equals 2, and so on. But what if we don't want to do this? What if I want 1, you want 2, somebody else wants 3? What if we want to get to a point where we could just come up with an actual function that we could just plug in our numbers. So we wouldn't have to do this formula over and over and over and over. So that's what we want to eventually get to where our derivative not being a number, meaning the slope, make it a function that we could plug in a particular value and then we could get our slope. So that's what this is saying here is the instantaneous rate of change of f at a particular value of x. So this is where we started. This is where we're going to go. The only things you notice different, instead of m calling it the slope, we're going to call it the derivative. Notice that little prime there. This is not f of x. f of x is the value of the function. That little prime says the derivative. Notice the difference here. Instead of using a particular x sub 0, is to, you know normally we say that's a particular value of x, we're saying, I don't care what value of x you have, we're going to come up with a function, a derivative function, so we can simply plug in the value of x. All right, so how could we come up with an actual function so we could just plug in a value for any point? So let's go back where we started all this craziness, where we had Galileo's free fall law, and we had this function. All right, and what we would like to do is to come up with a derivative function. So notice the difference there, that little prime. So this is what we want to actually find. So what I always say is start with your formula, which is the limit as h goes to 0. We'll use their, these variables, so you know whether you use x or t's or whatever. So the formula, the limit definition, is this f of t plus h minus f of t all over h. And what we did last time is we said, okay, well, we could plug in 1, right? Well, let's not plug in any number. Let's just actually use our function here and plug our function in and leave t and h alone. So to do this, once again, I have my limit as h goes to 0. I'm going to use my function here. Let me get some other pretty colors here. And notice this is what I'm going to be plugging in where I see t. All right, so where I see t, 16t, t plus h. Don't lose your squared. It's 16t squared minus 16, where I see t, I'm going to plug in t, don't forget your squared, and then all over h. Now this just flat out becomes an algebra problem. So I go through, limit as h goes to 0. You remember how to FOIL this? Please tell me you do. That's t plus h 
times t plus h. There's nice little shortcuts, but if you don't remember them, you're just foiling them. So the shortcut is for this being a um, binomial squared is you square the first term plus two times the other terms, and then you square the last term. All right, and then the last piece just becomes 16t squared all over h. Now, the next thing that I'm going to do here is I'm going to distribute the 16 to every single one of those values. So I have my limit as h goes to 0 still, 16t squared plus 32th plus 30, not 30, 16 h squared minus 16 t squared all over h. So all I did was multiply each one of these terms by 16. All right, so next limit as h goes to 0. This will always, always happen. Everything that does not have an h will cancel. It will always, always happen, okay, no matter what. So then what I'm left with is 32th plus 16h squared all over h. Well, from here, limit as h goes to 0, I could factor out an h on the top, which leaves me 32t plus 16h. Okay, so I factored out an h there and an h there. And so, of course, now those cancel. And I'm simply left with the limit as h goes to 0 of 32t plus 16h. Well, think about it. If we're saying let h go to 0, what I have done, and this is huge, Huge! What I have done is I have come up with a function of 32t, because that's all that's left over, that now I could plug in any value of t, and I could tell you the rate of change based on that particular time. Huge! Because I don't have to go through this formula for every single value that I want to look for.